this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today we're going to be talking about blue-white in Lord of the Rings Limited. So, uh, as always, the notes are available to follow along for patrons of patreon.com slash drafting archetypes at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. Getting right into it. Blue White is the third worst performing deck ahead of only blue green and green white. So for those keeping score at home, that's all of the Bant colors combinations are in the bottom three, uh, with blue white being the best of the Bant combinations. A lot of what you're seeing here is that red and black are really, really good, and the other colors are not as good. Blue white is also the second least drafted color pair ahead of only red green. Uh, despite all of that, I actually like blue white. I have been drafting blue a lot and I've been doing very well. Uh, blue is in, in, in an interesting position in Lord of the Rings Limited because none of its cards are particularly good. They just aren't. It doesn't have standout cards. Not even standout commons. It doesn't have standout cards like at any rarity. It has one exceptional rare in the 3-3 three, three rangers that steal your opponent's creature. And like after that, at least when I checked a while ago, the best performing blue cards were the counter spells, which, you know, relative to counter spells that we see compared to the power level of other blue cards in other sets, there's like you know, there should be a lot of blue cards that are better than the counter spells, and there just aren't. So, like, it doesn't have individually great cards, but as a whole, I've found it to play really, really well. And I kind of want to say that it plays support to other colors well, but I've also been doing well in decks that have like 17 or 18 or more blue cards and just a few cards of another color. So blue is really really good at drawing and finding cards in this format uh, it has a lot of card selection and a lot of card advantage and so if you have good cards in your other colors then your blue cards let you draw and cast those cards a lot more and also while single blue cards don't really stand out the play patterns of how the blue cards have played together have been good for me. So I think there's a lot going on with blue, and I think that the blue archetypes are pretty strong, with the exception of blue-green, which I have a little bit of hope for when drafted not as a scry deck, but which I'm overall pretty pessimistic about. This is where I might normally look at cards that have done well uh, in the archetype in aggregate on 17 lands, but because I'm more confident in the way that I've been drafting blue, because I've been doing a lot and having success, than the way that people in aggregate have been drafting blue because they haven't had success, I want to focus on my most drafted blue commons personally instead of uh, like the public stats for blue cards uh, in terms of like which commons I want to highlight. So my most drafted blue cards, these would be effectively the cards that I value more than other people do, right? Because that's what leads to you getting a card a lot. Like if everyone else thinks a card's good and you think a card is good, then you just get, you know, a normal number of them. But if you think a card is more good than other people, then you get more of them. So my most drafted blue cards in order are Lorien Revealed, the Island Cycler that is 5-mana draw 3, Pelerier Sur Survivor, the 2-mana 1-3 that taps for a man of any color, for instance, in sorceries, and can mill your opponent. Hithlane Knots, 1 and a blue instant, scry 1, draw 1, tap a creature. Birthday Escape, blue draw a card, the ring tempts you sorcery. Glorious Gale, the Essence Scatter that tempts if it counters legendary. And Deceive the Messenger, the... Uh, common minus three minus zero amass one instant, followed by isolation of Orthnak or Orthank, the Griptide, the put a creature on second from the top of its deck instant of its owner's deck instant, and dreadful as the storm, the uh, five five tempt instant for three mana. So what you might notice about that list of cards is 
it's all instants and sorceries except for the survivor who plays well with instants and sorceries and doesn't want that many creatures. So while I'm drafting blue cards a lot, what I'm not doing is I'm not drafting a lot of the 2-1 that gets an extra power and unblockable when you scry or the 2-1 flyer that draws a card when it dies. Whatever other creatures there are in blue, I'm not taking them and I'm not really playing them. I'm focusing my blue decks very, very, very heavily on spells. So the main way that I'm approaching most of my blue decks is I'm trying to have inevitability. And there are two main ways that I go about accomplishing that. They are both reliant on uncommons. The first is to have the bath song. The bath song by itself gives you a good amount of inevitability because it gives you a decent amount of card advantage and selection. And then on its third chapter, gives you uh, all your strong cards back, which uh, just increases the strength of your library as a whole to give you kind of a persistent advantage through the rest of the game. If you have two of them, then it becomes more of an actual game plan and you can do the endlessly loop your deck thing, sort of. If Bath Song is in your bottom six cards, then you can't do that, which means that you might want to prioritize having some scry and then aggressively scry things to the bottom to make sure that your bath song is not near the bottom if your deck is really dedicated to looping bath song something to watch out for also something that i have been looking for an opportunity to do but haven't done is to splash just a tiny just a single green card uh which is revive the shire as a way to regrow my bath song to be able to loop without having a second bath song. In blue white, you can also do that with uh, Samwise the Stout. Samwise can pick up the bath song and then you can wait until Samwise dies somehow and then bath song it back and loop that way. So it's easiest to loop with two copies of bath song, but there are some other ways to do it. So that the, the bath song either individually or as part of some kind of combo is one way that I try to have inevitability to my blue decks. The other option is a different splash, uh, which is to splash Gandalf's Sanction, the uh, blue-red instant, uh, the blue-red sorcery, rather, that uh, does damage equal to the number of instants and sorceries you control to a creature, but excess damage is dealt to the, uh, that creature's controller, so it's like a damage spell with trample. And I've been playing... 13 plus instants and sorceries in most of my blue decks. And so that'll usually hit someone for about half their life total. I can usually get enough damage in that I can plan for that card to be lethal when I cast it. But I do like to make sure of it by also playing one or two copies of Treason of Isengard, if and only if I have Gandalf Sanction to get back with it. Treason of Isengard is the three mana amass two and uh, put up to one instant or sorcery from your graveyard on top of your deck, uh, which I like to play as a way to reuse my Gandalf Sanctions. There are very, very few other cards that I care about casting multiple times enough that I would want to play Treason of Isengard, but I do very highly value the ability to rebuy Gandalf Sanctions specifically. You can play just blue with a ton of cantrips and some card draw and whatever removal you can get in like this kind of all spells deck that wins with some incidental tokens and you know a couple random creatures that you get that are strong cards as long as you have the bath song or gandalf sanction as the way to win in this spell-based blue deck and it doesn't honestly matter much what your second color is in this blue control deck i've played you know, blue inevitability the deck with really any combination of white, red, and black. And they all offer, you know, a bit of removal in one form or another, and then some just generically good cards, which is really what you're looking for to round out your blue decks. But this podcast is not only about blue control generically. If it were, I would simply call that the title. That's just, I think, one of the ways to approach blue-white. There is another way, and that is 
the Tempt Tempo deck. So the reason that I think that it's worth specifying that the aggressive e tempo e version of blue white kind of necessarily is a deck where tempt is a central thing that's going on is both i think tempt is pretty important in this format for aggressive decks generally since it's a good way to push damage and avoid flooding but also if you think about blue white tempo decks in limited in general you typically imagine them with a lot of uh, cheap flying creatures. And this format doesn't offer those. That's just not a thing. The, the role that flying plays in most limited sets has been replaced with the tempt mechanic. Um, that role being to make sure that there are some creatures that are harder to block, to make sure that games don't drag on too long. And so if you're trying to do the normal blue-white thing, you need access to tempt as this format's version of having flyers there are flying creatures in blue white but there are not very many of them and they are very expensive and understated partially because flying is so rare it means that they are more evasive but they the the poor rate that they offer is a problem also independently from all of the like strategic positioning of tempt uh blue white has a draw a second card mechanic in the set which honestly doesn't matter for very many cards uh most notably i think does matter for uh prince imrahil and uh the four four flyer for six that costs four if you've drawn your second card this turn uh so the two blue white uncommons obviously given that blue white is the second least drafted color pair the blue white commons typically aren't drafted very highly, so if you're playing blue-white, it's very likely that you'll have multiple blue-white uncommons if you want them, and being able to trigger them reliably and repeatedly makes them a lot better. In particular, the 4-4 four, four for 4 is very, very good, where the 4-4 four, four for 6 is very, very bad, and if you have to cast a spell to draw your second card, then you're not actually getting it for 4 mana, so you want to be able to draw a second card without casting a spell. And the easiest way to do that is by attacking with a ring bearer. The other primary way to do it would be by sacrificing a wizard's rockets. So you really want to have a level two ring with a ring bearer that can attack in any blue-white deck that's trying to do that blue-white thing and also just basically in any blue-white deck that has any interest in attacking whatsoever. The important stages of the ring are really chapter 2 and chapter 4. Uh, chapters 1 and 3 make your creatures harder to block, but given that you're typically putting the ring on really small creatures, the small creatures being harder to block doesn't change much. What matters is being able to draw your extra card to get those triggers and to improve your hand. And then the three extra damage really lets you race uh, a lot easier, which is important for the tempo builds of blue-white. So the controlling builds, if they're invested in tempting, which they don't have to be, only really care about getting to the second chapter, but the tempo builds really want to try to get to the fourth chapter as soon as possible which means that I would really prioritize trying to have like six or more ways to make the ring tempt you in your blue-white tempo decks. And just in general, when drafting this format, um, you really want to think about how much tempting you're doing because the value of the ring tempting you changes a lot depending on how much other ring tempting you have. To give a concrete example, Took Reaper, the one in a white 2-1 uh, that tempts you when it dies, is, I think, the best white 2-drop in a heavy tempt deck where you're really just looking to turn on high levels of the ring. Whereas if Took Reaper is your only tempt card, so it's just when it dies, one of your creatures gets harder to block once, and then when that creature is dead, you never get to use the ring again. 
it would be the weakest of the white two drops. So literally the the entire range of uh you know power level among white common two drops, you know, from best to worst is available depending just on how many other temp cards you have in your deck. So you uh you really want to be, you know, thinking about where you're going with your temp cards and how many of them you're going to have um while you're drafting and make sure that you're, you know, keeping pace if you're drafting a deck that's going to be doing that thing. Hobbit Sting is another card that I want to mention specifically. Hobbit Sting is a one in a white uh, to do damage equal to number of creatures plus foods to target creature at instant speed. In general, this card is uh, pretty good in green-white, which is good at generating a lot of food. Um, food is a much more reliable way to power up Hobbit Sting than creatures, because creatures have a habit of getting killed or trading off, whereas food tends to stay in play until you decide that it shouldn't be in play anymore. Blue-white has a hard time making food, which means that Hobbit Sting generally isn't very good there. However, I've had some decks that play multiple copies of Lembus, which is the um, food artifact that scries and cantrips when you play it, and um, if you just get those into play and then you play some uh, like Protector of Gondors, the 3-3 that makes it 1-1, it can be like pretty reasonable to support Hobbit Sting. And blue-white decks really, really value having an additional 2-mana instant speed removal spell if you can get it. Another card to look for that is just a strong card that will let you put Hobbit Sting in your deck more often is Build a Pony, the 4-mana 1-4 that makes 2 food when it enters. So that's to say, if you end up with Bill, then it might behoove you to start looking for Lembus and then maybe even uh, the 2-3 Farmer that makes a food so that you can be in a position to take advantage of Hobbit Stings, which otherwise you would generally not take in a blue eye deck. So you, you want to be thinking about, like, am I supporting a food package where I'm going to take Hobbit Sting? Yes or no. Am I supporting a Tempt package? Yes or no? Hopefully yes, but maybe no. If you are, then you probably want like Soothing of Smeagol, the the bounce, the one in a blue bounce and non-token creature tempt card is very, very good if you're like a tempt tempo deck, but very, very bad if you are not that. If you don't have a lot of tempt and you're a control deck, I've had really horrible experiences with soothing. So what I'm talking around that I was, I think, maybe intending to say later is last week when I was talking about Red Black, I talked about how all of its cards are just kind of generically good. It can play a really wide range of game plans, and it doesn't matter how that much how you combine the cards. You just take the good ones and play them together Sometimes your deck will end up being a little more aggressive, sometimes a little more controlling, sometimes mid-range or able to like pivot in a game depending on what's going on. All of that's really great and very, very much not the case with blue-white. With blue-white, you really need to know what your deck is doing and how your cards fit together. That doesn't mean that blue-white is bad. It just means that you need to really understand what you're doing and have a plan and draft to that plan. And if you do that, I've had good experiences with blue white. But it's really a lot easier to mess up your deck, use the wrong cards, and use cards in the wrong way in blue white. So trying to find more things to say to help you avoid <laughs> messing up blue white in that way. Dreadful is the storm, the uh three mana instant that makes a creature a five five and tempts you is easily overlooked. But notably, it is the highest performing common in blue-white on 17 lands. Like I said, I think that blue-white is usually going to have very small creatures, which means that you're not necessarily doing that much damage per attack. But when you get the ring up to the top level, the three extra damage is big. And then if you amass, or if you dreadful as the storm, either a 1-1 human, four extra damage, or an orc army uh, a mass you know token of any size it's five extra damage if it's getting you to the third the fourth chapter of the ring it's three more damage on top of that 
So this is seven or eight damage out of nowhere. It's really easy to get into a spot where your opponent doesn't have any idea that the game is about to end. And uh, they, you know, let your 1-1 one, one that looks like it's just attacking to loot through and they just die to a ton of damage that they didn't expect out of uh, Dreadful is the Storm. Additionally, blocks get kind of weird with the ring and Dreadful is the Storm is going to basically win any combat where something is blocking your ring bearer. And also 5-5 five, five is bigger than basically every creature people play so it works reasonably well as just you know kill an attacking or blocking creature if you have a creature that can get in combat with it so that that's a trick that's overperformed especially when you care a lot about that tempt part of the card so i mentioned that that has the highest win rate it has the highest win rate in a very small sample size and as a card that's drafted extremely late it is not in the running for being the best common in these color combinations. I don't want to give the wrong impression or oversell it. It's a good card that you should be playing, but it's not you should be aggressively drafting it. You'll table it and you don't want a lot of them. The key commons that you actually want, the best commons, are uh, Errand Rider of Gondor and Birthday Escape in the aggressive versions. Birthday Escape plays very well with Errand Rider of Gondor. It makes sure that uh, you have the ability to have a legendary creature so that you don't have to put a card back when you errand rider both errand rider and birthday escape trigger any draw your second card stuff that you might be doing birthday escape helps uh make sure that you are keeping your temp stuff going errand rider is just straight up card advantage it's going to trade for a whole card all the time and draw a card most of the time worst case give you some card selection you really want as many of both of those cards as you can get however I think that if you're a control deck that doesn't care so much about the uh, tempting and tempo and stuff thing, then your best commons are Lorien Revealed and Glorious Gale, the draw three land cycler and the counterspell. And, you know, what I'm really trying to do with my control decks is just use counterspells, use removal, use scrying and life gaining from Lembus and from not to stay alive to the point where I can cast Lorien Revealed and then kind of keep pace with my opponent and eventually like bury them in card advantage, card selection, and just kind of never like let them get a good hold in the game. And Errand Rider of Gondor is a big part of that because it's uh, kind of like, a you know, it can usually trade with a creature and draw a card. So it's, you know, it plays like removal when you don't care about killing your opponent you just care about card advantage it's like a you know cantrip removal spell some noteworthy uncommons samwise the stout-hearted the uh two mana two one flash that when it enters returns a permanent from your graveyard uh to your hand a permanent that went to the graveyard from the battlefield this turn from your graveyard to your hand and tempts you really great card regardless of what you're doing with it uh i've played against a lot of opponents who We'll just cast it on turn two for no value to get a creature going and get Tempt going. Not the worst if that has to happen, especially if you're following it up with an Errand Rider of Gondor. That's a really good curve. But I do really like to prioritize being able to proactively get value from Samwise without needing to rely on setting up a spot where my opponent kills one of my things into open mana. And for that reason, uh, when I have Samwise, I really like to prioritize Wizards, Rockets, and Lembus so that you can sacrifice either of those and get them back with Samwise. Note, with Lembus, it might read like it doesn't work with Samwise because it shuffles itself from your graveyard into your library. But as long as you respond to that shuffle trigger with Samwise, you can uh, still pick up the Lembus and uh, you know get that card advantage you were looking for. I think that covers both my general notes about strategy as well as some single card shoutouts. So... I'm going to turn it over to uh, Twitch chat for any follow-up questions. So I want to thank my newest uh, patron at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. Uh, buy me or you. Thank you so much for the support. Um, Do you find that you're able to find the uncommons later, or are you drafting those first before moving into the archetype? So 
like I said, because the uh, color pair is drafted so little, I think the uncommons tend to go late, possibly especially in packs two or three, but I haven't really been following that. So I, I do think that they are just like statistically based on how late they go and when you're more likely to see them, uh, more likely going to be a reward for being in the archetype than a reason to go into the archetype. Though I do think that, you know, while I wouldn't generally want to like first pick a blue-white uncommon, I could easily see, you know, starting with a blue card or a white card and then, you know, pick three or four not knowing what my second color is and seeing one of them is a good reason to go into the combination. But I could also, you know, even in pack one, I might try to table one of them since uh, blue-white is so n unpopular. Where does uh, Slip on the Ring fit into this archetype? So, as I said, I personally have mostly drafted the um, more controlling versions of the deck that are not so into Tempt. And so, like, for me personally, the cards that are played where a big part of their power level is the Tempt Rider, uh, which I think describes uh, Slip on the Ring, they're not cards that I've played a lot of that have been great for me. I think Slip on the Ring is an acceptable but low-end uh, ring tempt card that gets appreciably better the more uh, Errand Riders of Gondor you have. Pay attention to other ETBs also, but the most common is going to be just using it on Errand Rider so that you draw a card and tempt so you're kind of turning it into like a two mana instant speed birthday escape, but you can also, you know, if you're very lucky, like dodge a removal spell or get a free block or something like that out of it. But I think that it's, you know, like a worse trick in that deck than something like Suiting a Smeagol. Does the synergy between Knots and Banish make Banish a reasonable include in the control build of Blue Eight, or are you still not wanting to play it? I am reasonably happy to play Banish in the hard controlling versions of Blue White. That's a card that I don't want at all in the like aggressive tempo versions, but I think it's pretty good in the Blue White in the like controlling versions. And I would go so far as to say that I think that it's good with or without knots. I think that um, you know, just like getting attacked by a creature and then killing it isn't the end of the world either, uh, in that kind of deck. So independent of like that synergy, but slightly helped by that synergy. Uh, yeah, B Banish is pretty good in the, you know, kill your stuff, draw a bunch of cards, win somehow eventually decks. Since it's so unpopular, I doubt it would happen, but would you say that both the control and Tempt Tempo Blue White can coexist in the same pod? Yes, very much. I think that they are looking for really different commons, obviously. You're not going to uh, both get a bunch of the uncommons, and you'd be, you know, better off if you did. But uh, I, I do think that it wouldn't be that bad for either player if both happened to be at the same table. Do you find yourself splashing much with this archetype? So I think that this archetype splashes well. As always, the more controlling splashes better than the more aggressive. However, uh, given that the more aggressive is leaning really heavily on tempt, which gives you a lot of card selection. It's relatively forgiving of, uh, you know, the splash. And then, you know, if you have like Samwise the Stouthearted, then you kind of want Wizard Rockets anyway. And I talked about, uh, you know, splashing Gandalf Sanction as a way to get inevitability in the control version. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think that this color combination broadly is relatively friendly to splashing. Is Reprieve a more controlling card or more tempo card? Reprieve works well. That's the uh, remand type card. It just is good generically. Works works either way. It can be used to you know buy you time when you would be falling behind, or it can be used to keep your opponent behind when you're uh, killing them. I, I think it its overall power level doesn't really change all that much depending on what you're trying to do. Have you used the one the uh, Pelger Survivor as your win condition, what, like with the mill plan? Um, should I not be in the uh, Blue X controlling space without already having the inevitability, inevitability picked up early? I have occasionally killed people with the mill thing. I don't want it to be like a huge part of my plan, but uh, it's a fine incidental way to end the game. As far as not being in the controlling space without having already uh, picked up the inevitability early, 
sometimes you just get good card advantage and removal and stuff and you figure it out and sometimes you're not you know lucky enough to see like bath song or sanction and uh you just have to like do it with other cards and in that spot trying to mill them out with the one three or even the three three the amass three and then mill them equal to your army or whatever are acceptable ways uh to um kill someone next question would you force blue white if you pack one pick one blue white farmier so this is not a use of force that i really understand to me you know forcing generally represents a pre-draft bias so like you know obviously pack one, like blue white far the rare farmier is an extremely strong card so if i open it i'm going to take it and i'm going to try to put it in my deck if by force you mean would you be closed off to playing any other colors no of course not farmier is very splashable if by force you mean would you be committed to putting farmier in your deck because it's splashable i'm going to go pretty far to try to make sure that it's in my deck but if i see you know three picks in a row that don't have a blue or a white card and i get past great cards in other colors that aren't compatible with farmier then farmier might not end up in my deck would you mulligan aggressively for curve with this or is it okay to keep a hand with no two drop really depends on you know what kind of deck you're playing and how good your hand is what your recovery situation is like for example if you're either build of the deck and you don't have a two drop but you have you know something you can play for three mana three lands and a rare faramir then i'm probably going to keep no matter what because uh there's a really good chance that the faramir is going to uh recover and or win the game basically regardless of where we are if i'm a deck that I feel like I really need to get my opponent dead and I don't have cards that are going to let me start doing that, then I would probably mulligan. But I will say that even the like aggressive version of blue-white isn't so much about, you know, can I kill him on turn five or whatever. Like you're not trying to end the game immediately. You're still playing a lot of, you know, value type stuff and you care about pressuring your opponent, but you're still trying to play you know, like a seven turn game or an eight turn game. Whereas the hard control version is trying to play like a nine to 15 turn game or something. What would make me personally uh, draft the tempo one, like mid draft if I started out more controlling? I think just in general, if I'm not seeing a lot of the like Lorien reveals and good removal stuff, and I uh, happen to pick up a decent number of like if i see birthday escapes and errand riders more than i see uh revealed and gale and banish then i would keep going that way what do you do when you're playing best of one with the control version against a go wide type deck dig for a creature yeah uh dig for a cre like you, you have a lot of scry and so you know, if, if you understand that board presence is what you're going to need, then you just try to find whatever board presence you have. Sometimes that involves, like, casting a Treason of Isengard that I am generally hoping to not have to cast, just so that I have a 2-2 that can block some 1-1s or whatever. Maybe, uh, you know, similarly, like, firing off Deceive the Messenger uh, more aggressively to get something into play and then maybe you end up needing to you know use dreadful as a storm on that one one uh defensively against something that's not great just to like turn on tempt a little bit earlier so that you can uh like try to dig for more board presence um more aggressively than you might otherwise uh that kind of thing i suppose all right I think that's going to wrap it up. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, listening, especially those in uh, Twitch chat who uh, helped with questions. And uh, that's that's going to do it for now. I'll be back next week with another episode chosen by a Patreon poll. And I expect that I'll be able to open that poll up to uh, more different color combinations. Uh, with this one, I did only offer... Uh, blue combinations 
uh, to patrons uh, because I felt like those were the uh, archetypes that I knew best, but I'm optimistic about having a more robust knowledge set about the format for next week's episode. So uh, thanks again. Have a good week, everyone. And I'm gone for now. Bye. Prepare for light speed.